Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. And I am so excited because on the show we have somebody that I love that's like a brother to me. And the topic of the show is the dilemma of vitamin D. The dilemma of vitamin D, to D or not to D, and how much to D to take. Because a lot of people are thinking if vitamin D is good, then a lot of vitamin D is better. And we're going to hear from Dr. Alan Gaby today more of the statistics and science that can make you think about how to take vitamin D in a healthy way and to protect yourself against unhealthy supplementation. Now, let me tell you a little bit about his background. This is a really incredible guy. Besides the fact that Dr. Jonathan Wright fixed him and I up in 1978 on a day thinking we were a match made in heaven because we were both students getting a rotation in integrative medicine with the father of bioidentical hormones, um, Dr. Jonathan Wright, in Washington. He's gone on to be known as the father of nutrition. In fact, he's written a book. He's going to hold this book up for you now. If you can hold it up, one of the most important books ever written on nutrition ever, Nutritional Medicine. That's the second edition. And I want you to take a look that if you open this up, this has all the research where people say, oh, there's not enough research for nutrition. Dr. Gaby took his whole entire life. This book is his life. He put all the research into this book. And if you don't read it, you can do weightlifting with it. But the publishing company is Fritz Perlberg Publishing. The three of us used to hang out in Baltimore. In fact, I dated Fritz for a little while because my date with Ellen didn't work out. So we all go way, way back. And hopefully as we've moved forward, we've really been trying to make a swath in life. And when Ellen and I were talking the other day, he said he's made it his life journey to show people the efficacy of nutrition as a clinical tool and to make sure people don't go at it dangerously like I do with hormones. So he is a medical doctor. He received his undergraduate degree from Yale University. That's no small little university. That's Yale. He got his master's of science in biochemistry from Emory and his medical degree from the University of Maryland. His father was a surgeon that I had a little bit of a crush on, and he's gone and his mom is gone. But it's really an honor to have you on the show. So welcome to the show, Alan. Dr. Burks, and thank you. And I'm so sorry that our date didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> the reason but like it- you said, I would have been I would have been a lousy boyfriend because I spent all my time in the medical library going through the uh, the stacks, looking up old titles and new research and everything. And like you said, I made it my life's work to get, to find all of the research that I could. Uh, to summarize it, categorize it, analyze it, and also to use nutritional therapies in clinical practice to figure out for myself what worked and what didn't. And this culminated in a 36-year project, which is this book that you mentioned, Nutritional Medicine. It has 16,800 references to the scientific literature. So like you said, when people say there's no research, there's definitely a lot of research. Boy, yeah, and that had a lot to do with why we didn't jive on our date because you said you wanted to go eat Chinese food. And I said at that <laughs> point, I couldn't because at that point, all Chinese food contained monosodium glutamate. And you knew from the research that if you took B6 or magnesium and you said, let's go over to the clinic and I'll give you a Myers cocktail, which is an IV push of magnesium and B6, you can get that first and then you can go eat and not have a Chinese syndrome reaction. And I realized if you wanted me to have to go get an IV to go out to dinner with you, that we were probably meant to be friends rather than <laughs> lifelong romantic partners. And then when um, I had breast cancer, you sent me that beautiful little card with a picture of two boobs. And you said, I love these. I want you to come detox with me so we can t- caretake them. And we sat in the sauna as part of Walter Crinian's detox while you would just read through massive piles of literature, which were part of your 36-year project of nutritional medicine. So and you, I know which ones they were because they have sweat on them still. It's kind of got <laughs> dried sweat on it. Do you remember what happened to my T-shirt? Yeah. Oh, that was amazing. Uh, you had so many toxic chemicals in your body. I think you lived over a, uh, what, a, a dry cleaner? Yeah. Uh, and and we, uh, you were staying at my house, and we would wash the clothes that we were sweating in during the detox. And when we finished washing your T-shirt, it had about a hundred holes in it. And you said, what kind of crazy detergent 
are you using? And I showed you all the other clothes in, in the washing machine, none of them had holes in them. So I think what happened is you were putting so many uh, pesticides and other chemicals out that they got onto your shirt and somehow they interacted with the detergent. And that's just amazing how much stuff was in your body. I know. And that probably had a lot to do with the vulnerability besides being a DES daughter of getting cancer. But then when we did the follow-up blood serum levels of the chemicals, just like Walter Crinian said, at six months and a year and a year and a half out, they went down to almost zero. So it was very effective to do the detox. Those that detox together, stay friends together and family together. So there's no better person to really tackle the vitamin D controversy or the dilemma of vitamin D than you. So can you first tell us what exactly is vitamin D? Is it a vitamin? Is it a hormone? Why is it called both? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, it's not clear whether vitamin D really is a vitamin. If you look back in human history, um, the, the main dietary sources of vitamin D are vitamin D fortified milk, which prehistoric people certainly didn't have. Uh, they didn't have milk and they didn't have vitamin D fortification. And then there's a little bit in fish and there's a small amount in eggs and maybe some in mushrooms. So the human diet really had little to no vitamin D throughout our evolutionary history. Vitamin D is a precursor molecule. A precursor means something that gets converted into something else. And it is produced in the skin, as most people know, by a reaction with ultraviolet light and a steroid-like molecule in the skin. So vitamin D is a sunlight-derived factor, and when we discovered the chemical structure of it and we found out that people were getting rickets, which was due to a severe vitamin D deficiency, we discovered that we could give it by mouth and that we could prevent these deficiency problems. Uh, over the years, having looked at the research, I, when I started my practice in 1981, everybody was scared of vitamin D. The avant-garde nutritional supplement companies put either 100 units a day or 200 units a day, not 1,000, 100 units a day in their multivitamins because research had come out at the time showing that animals who are given even moderately high doses of vitamin D develop atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. And people were extremely scared of vitamin D. And then for some reason, it all shifted. In the 1990s, well, I know what the reason is. In the 1990s, a bunch of observational studies came out. Now, what are observational studies? They are studies where you look at a certain behavior and you compare it or you relate it to a certain outcome. So people who do A have less of certain disease or more of certain disease. As all scientists and doctors know, observational studies do not prove causation which means that even though you find an association, it may have nothing to do with what's causing what. And one of the best examples was uh, for decades, doctors were totally convinced based on observational studies that horse estrogen, uh, Premarin, was useful for preventing heart disease and some other common diseases. And that was because women who took Premarin had less of this disease. The problem is, that women who took Premarin were very different in many ways from women who did not take it. For example, they saw the doctor more often, they had higher income, they lived in uh, safer environments, they had less stress, uh, they took more vitamins, they ate better and things like that. So you could not necessarily credit their estrogen taking for their outcome. The only way you can determine whether it's really true is to do a randomized controlled trial. And that's where you randomly assign half the group to receive the treatment, the other half to receive a placebo. And when they did that, they found exactly the opposite, that women who were taking Premarin had more heart disease than those who were given a placebo. So uh, that's an example of how observational studies can lead you in the wrong direction. Boy, we could get into a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but I'm going to just keep going on. I'm not going to, I'm going to duct tape, duct tape here. But I, <laughs> I, I want to just add one little thing about um, the vitamin definition. 
I think that when I used to work in the dialysis center with Dr. Moncrief, he would say vitamin D is also a hormone because it has these receptors called the vitamin D receptor or the VDR standing for vitamin D receptor. And they're present in almost every single tissue of the body. And the other thing is, is that even though it's start the initiating act as sunlight on the skin, it has to be hydroxylated or acted upon enzymatically at the liver and then at the kidney, which is why a lot of kidney patients have a lot of problems with vitamin D because you need to have a healthy liver and a healthy kidney. So D is this global thing which needs a bunch of steps to be activated and it does act somewhat like a hormone. Um, And I just wanted to make that comment because it's so incredibly confusing to understand what exactly the status of vitamin D is. Yeah, well, thanks for pointing that out. That's entirely true. And I should have said that vitamin D, uh, well, it's actually vitamin D is a pre-hormone, which gets converted to another hormone. The molecule for the technicians out there is 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. But yes, it's got to be converted in the liver and the kidney to this active hormone. So yeah, vitamin D would be considered a hormone precursor. Uh, now, back to the to the idea of the observational studies. A number of many, many studies found, and other ones continue to find, that people who have higher blood levels of a certain form of vitamin D, this is the kind they measure, it's called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. People who have higher blood levels have less osteoporosis, less cancer, less heart disease, and less of a whole lot of other conditions. And based on that, uh, people made the leap, probably inappropriately, that if you intervene to push your level up, that you will prevent those diseases. But as I said before, observational studies do not prove causation. And there is an important confounding factor, and that is that blood levels of vitamin D decline in response to inflammation. So people that have chronic inflammation which is most of the chronic illnesses that we suffer from are associated with inflammation. Inflammation pushes the level of 25-hydroxy vitamin D down. So when you observe that people with higher blood levels of this vitamin have better health outcomes, it may have absolutely nothing to do with vitamin D. It may just mean that people who have inflammation are sicker than people who don't have inflammation And as a sidebar, the inflammation also pushes down the vitamin D level. So that's why I think people have taken a wrong turn. They also determined that a relatively high blood level above the level needed to prevent deficiency is associated with the best outcomes. And because of that, people have again made what I believe to be an inappropriate conclusion that if you take more and more vitamin D, until you push that blood level up to a certain amount, then you're going to have the greatest prevention for these diseases, when in fact, most of the research that has come out has shown either that high doses are no better than moderate doses, or that high doses actually produce worse outcomes than moderate doses. Now, what am I calling moderate doses? 800 to 1200 units a day, I would consider a moderate dose. A high dose in my opinion, others disagree, of course, is anything more than 2,000 units a day. Right. Patients are coming in all the time now on 10,000, sometimes higher than that, of international units of D a day. Yeah. And and a lot of people tolerate it just fine. But I have heard many stories of kidney stones cropping up in people with no history of kidney stones after they start taking 5,000 or more units of vitamin D. And the randomized controlled trials do show an increased risk of kidney stones, even in people taking 400 to 800 units a day. It's not a a great increase. It's a small increase. But one of my, my colleagues in holistic medicine at the age of 75 began taking 5,000 units a day at the advice of his doctor based on this idea that you want to push the blood level really high. And within four weeks, for the first and only time in his life, he came up with a kidney stone. So, you know, anecdotal information doesn't prove anything, but I've seen this a lot and it concerns me. You know, there is a study that came out in May of 2019 from India, vitamin D toxicity, a prospective study from a tertiary care center in Kashmir Valley. And it was talking about how they're seeing more and more 
um, hypercalcemia, too much calcium being absorbed and deposited in soft tissue because people are taking so much vitamin D. So that came out. And then there's this study that I want you to talk about that came out just a, a week or two ago, not even that, a few days ago, in the current opinions of endocrinologic diabetes and obesity, the ongoing dilemma, that's why I named the radio the the dilemma, podcast, right. of vitamin D supplementation for non-skeletal health and bone health, where they were looking at 400 versus 4,000 versus 10,000 international units. Can you chat about that study, Alan? Yeah, I believe that what you just cited is a review of the original paper, which came out in the, uh, I think, the Journal of the American Medical Association just about a month ago. And so they they randomized a group of people to take, as you said, either 400, 4,000, or 10,000 units a day of vitamin D. And if I recall, they followed them for three years and they measured bone mineral density at two different sites. And the worst outcomes were in the 10,000 units a day, and that was statistically significant compared with the 4,000 units a day, com excuse me, compared with the 400 units a day. In addition, 4,000 units a day was significantly worse than 400 units a day at one of the two sites they measure, measured. It was also worse than 400 at the other site, but that difference was not statistically significant. So the bottom line here is that higher doses are less effective than lower doses for preventing bone loss in uh, postmenopausal and women and elderly men. Now, this is not the first study, study to examine that. A 2012 study showed something similar, although not as pronounced. In that study, they measured bone loss at four different sites, and in each of the four sites, bone loss was greater with 6,500 units a day than it was with 800 units a day. That difference was not statistically significant, but it was a trend towards worse outcomes with higher doses. Uh, the other study uh, showed no difference between high dose and moderate dose. So when you put those three studies together, it's almost guaranteed that high doses are not more effective than low doses with respect to preventing bone loss. And there's some degree of evidence that the higher doses are worse. This is not the only disease that's been investigated. They've also looked at multiple sclerosis and they compared 1,000 units a day to approximately 13,000 units a day uh, in people with chronic multiple sclerosis and they found that the number of disease exacerbations and the worsening of disability was significantly worse in the high dose group than it was in the low dose group. So uh, we really need to, to be concerned. We don't have any human studies on hardening of the arteries, but based on the animal studies, we need to be concerned about the possibility that long-term use of high doses could increase the risk of developing heart disease. We just don't know yet. Weren't there two studies that um, one at if you got your levels somewhat above 90 in the blood, that that was a, a higher probability, a higher risk of pancreatic cancer. And there was another cancer study that 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 lower mid range levels protect you against cancer. You don't want to be deficient if you have cancer, but when you got at really high levels, I think there were two studies that showed that there was an increased vulnerability to getting cancer. Do you know those studies? Well, there, there's so many studies on vitamin D, and it's so complicated. I can't say I remember exactly which study you're talking about. But what I can tell you is that a lot of the times they find that a high blood level is associated with increased risk of cancer, an abnormally high blood level. Like what but, level would that be? Well, I can't really say because I don't know. But um, I the think in the pancreatic is, study, it was in the 90s. Okay. Okay. But, but the question is... Um, is it the taking of the vitamin D that promotes the cancer, or is it a metabolic abnormality in these people that both promotes cancer and causes abnormalities of vitamin D metabolism? A lot of times you find that people have abnormally high levels of vitamin D because of some other abnormality. So you can't necessarily blame the taking of vitamin D on the cancer. Um, so I'd have to see what that study was to see if it was observational or to see whether it was a randomized controlled trial. The other question, the, a, lot, a lot of doctors now are measuring vitamin D levels in the blood. Uh, I see a lot of people, they say, well, my doctor showed me this number and uh, he told, told me take 5,000 units a day and we'll repeat it. 
in three months or six months or whatever. So aside from the fact that we can barely afford health care in this country and that we're spending now billions of dollars a year measuring vitamin D levels when we could just do like our grandmother said and go outside and get some sunlight, the question arises, and it's a rhetorical question because I'm going to answer it, how useful is measuring 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the standard vitamin D blood test? And one of the conclusions I draw in the vitamin D chapter of my textbook is that vitamin D is an extremely unreliable measure of vitamin D status. And there are a number of reasons for that. One of the most interesting ones is when you think you're measuring vitamin D, you cannot distinguish true vitamin D from certain other compounds that are floating around in the blood. And one of these is a molecule that gets converted into bile salts by the liver. It's called a bile salt precursor. It's got a really long chemical name, so I'm not going to state what it is. But the interesting thing is the amount of this bile salt that's reported as 25-hydroxy vitamin D in a blood test varies substantially. Some people, it's 0%. Other people, it's 35 to 50%. So when you get a 25-hydroxy vitamin D level reported, you don't have you have no idea whether half of it is actually this other molecule or none of it is actually this other molecule. So you really don't even know what you're measuring. How come in a lot of these studies it says that the testing of vitamin D is standardized beyond question? We know for sure what it is. Why is this not known? Well, maybe it's standardized, but they can't distinguish <laughs> this molecule from true vitamin D. And not only that, this was a study not too long ago. It was about 10 years ago. And labs supposedly had their act together back then. They sent similar blood samples to two different labs, and they used a certain cutoff period, uh, cutoff level for deficiency. In one of the uh, labs, 17% were reported as deficient. In the other lab, 90% were reported as deficient, even though it was the same or a very similar blood sample. So uh, different labs will give you different numbers. Now, maybe the same lab will, lab will give you consistent numbers. Uh, but let's put that aside for a minute that they can't necessarily even measure it correctly. And we'll put aside the idea that some of what they think they're measuring really isn't vitamin D. There's a third factor, and that is that we have a protein circulating in our blood known as vitamin D binding protein. And about 85% of the vitamin D that's in our blood is hooked on to this protein. And as such, it is biologically inactive. It's only the free form, the one that's floating around by itself, that is biologically active. And so we have no idea whether a person has a lot of uh, vitamin D binding protein in their blood or a little bit. Of course, you could measure it and spend a whole lot of other money. But when you get a, a report back on vitamin D levels, you don't know how much of it's active and how much of it is inactive. That's so, so interesting of- because with hormones, you'll run a sex hormone binding globulin because that binds up estrogen and testosterone. You can even order a free testosterone. So we take this concept in hormones and we utilize that to try and get a clearer picture for patients. But you're saying that we have a binding protein and we really don't can't measure that when we're measuring vitamin uh, well, D. Well, we can. It's just a lot more money. And I don't know if insurance will pay for it. Even if the even insurance did pay for it, you know, we, we huh. have limited resources. And uh, I don't think it's, it's useful from a uh, doctor's standpoint, to measure this. I, I don't think there's any evidence for that for the average healthy person. I'm not talking about people who have, say, Crohn's disease and they can't absorb anything. The average reasonably health, healthy person, I've seen no evidence that measuring blood levels and basing your dosing on that produces uh, any better outcomes than just going out in the sun a little bit and taking a moderate dose of vitamin D, uh, such as 800 to 1200 units a day. Now, is this explain a little bit the controversy of that surfer vitamin D study that came out? It was in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism 2007. You first turned me on to this study with these surfers that had an average of 28 hours in the sun. And when they were measured for their vitamin D level, only a third of them had normal levels. Is it, talk a little bit about that because that's mind boggling. It's called low vitamin D status despite abundant sun exposure because we say go out in the sun. So, Yeah. Well, to me, that supports the conclusion that vitamin D is a thoroughly unreliable, this is the, the blood level of 25-hydroxy vitamin D is a thoroughly unreliable measure of true vitamin D status. 
because when you got people average age 20s who have an average sun exposure of 29 hours a week in Hawaii, it seems impossible. With no sunscreen on and no right. body suits right. on. Right. Yeah. They did a what they called a sun exposure index, and that's the calculated full body sun exposure per week. And their calculated full body sun exposure, that's with no clothes, was 11, 11 hours, hours a week right. in Hawaii. So it, it seems impossible that any of them would be deficient in vitamin D. And yet, uh, d depending on how they measured it, uh, over 50 percent, according to one measurement, had suboptimal vitamin D levels. So what that tells me is that one of two things, either 25-hydroxy vitamin D is unreliable as a measure of vitamin D status, which, uh, which I've argued, or and or the cutoff levels that are being used to diagnose vitamin D deficiency are wrong. So what now, do you me, think me, the cutoff levels should be? Well, it really depends on the person. I think it's different for African Americans, for example, than it is for Caucasians. There's evidence to support that. Uh, it has to do with how much vitamin D binding protein. Well, is. What, what would be the difference for African Americans versus Caucasian? Can you expound well, on that a little bit? According to to the standard uh, criteria, it's about a third lower, about one third lower for African Americans than Caucasians. Now, I don't want to say necessarily. Now, what do you 20, exactly mean by that? Say. I know you're trying to pin me down. No, I want to like understand it. <laughs> I want to tell you why I'm behaving like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> because I use as the default idea that 25-hydroxy vitamin D is not a reliable indicator of vitamin D status. So to the extent that you have a set cutoff, you end up making wrong decisions when you rely on that. Um, so let me, let me go back a while. Back in the 1970s and 80s, the cutoff for deficiency was considered either 10 nanograms per ml or 15 nanograms per ml, depending on what measurement method was used. In more recent years, they have changed it. And now there's this thing they call vitamin D deficiency, which is 20 or less, or vitamin D insufficiency, which you might call mild deficiency. Vitamin D insufficiency is 30 nanograms per milliliter or less. Now, the problem is there are a lot of different people who would not be deficient when they're below 20. And therefore, to use a certain cutoff uh, is not appropriate. Because they have less, why would they not be deficient if they're below 20? Because they have less binding protein? Or what, what do you mean by that? That's one possibility. But the other thing is, there are many other things. I mean, I could talk until next year on this. 25-hydroxy um, vitamin D is just one of more than 50 metabolites of vitamin D. A metabolite is a breakdown product. Um, so there are at least 50 different vitamin D-like compounds circulating in the blood, and some of them bind to the hormone receptor that you referred to before. Some of them have unknown activities. We know one, for example, has an anti-skin uh, cancer action. Another one has an immune function enhancing action. Uh, so if there are 50 different vitamin D compounds circulating in the blood, and we're only measuring one of them, true vitamin D status might be some extremely complex interaction between many of these metabolites. So we have absolutely no idea. It's like saying uh, the Yankees scored three runs. Yeah, well, did they win or lose? I guess it depends on what the other team did. Uh, and this is also true. It's probably a complex function of the interaction between many different vitamin D metabolites, which is why uh, I, I cannot really give you a true cutoff level, but what okay. I can tell you, go ahead. Well, so one, it just gets confusing because we know patients who are vitamin D deficient. And I, so if somehow they're measured to be vitamin D deficient and they have cancer, when they receive vitamin D, it reduces their risk for mortality by 25%. This comes from the dilemma study that just came out, you know, a few days ago. And we know that pe adults, pre-diabetic adults, who are labeled vitamin D deficient and then given vitamin D reduce their risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 62%. So how do we then, if we've got these diseases, if we have cancer, if we're pre-diabetic, how do we then move forward with what might be the right level for us and to be diagnosed as being insufficient or deficient and then to take a, an adequate amount for protection? Okay. 
Well, I don't know if you're going to like this answer. <laughs> I, but I'll go over there. We, we cannot <laughs> tell. We cannot answer your question uh, based on current knowledge of what 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels mean in the blood. Uh, there is support for the idea that cancer patients uh, do better with extra vitamin D or that a little bit extra vitamin D might help prevent cancer to a small extent. There are a number of studies that support that. With regard to diabetes and prediabetes, there are at least 20 or 30 studies that have looked at that, and the vast majority of them do not support the one you just quoted. Um, so I'd have to say that that's uh, up in the air and it's, it leans against, to some extent, the idea that vitamin D can prevent diabetes. But let's suppose for a minute that what you said is true, maybe it is, it gets me back to the idea that getting some sunlight and taking a moderate dose of vitamin D is probably, based on the available knowledge that we have in science, is probably the best that we can do. That if we try to micromanage it based on blood levels, we are sometimes going to do the wrong thing. We're going to keep pushing the level up. Uh, for example, people in Lebanon, uh, the average blood level is well below 20. And yet none of them seem to have any evidence of vitamin D deficiency. Uh, most of them are out in the sun all day. They're robustly healthy. And yet maybe for genetic factors, uh, their levels are low. We have no idea what it means. Um, so that might not be intellectually satisfying, but I think that's where we are right now. What do you take? Do you take vitamin D every day? Um, I take a walk and I uncover my arms and legs and I bask in the sun. Now, let me talk about the sun for a minute. Okay, because, you know, most kids these days don't go outside very much. Most of us well, live should. as moles in front of our computer. They should. Now, we've talked over the years, and I'm sure you've talked about vitamin E being at least four different molecules, maybe eight, depending on how you define it, and that you can't just take one of those four and expect to get the best outcomes. We're dealing with the vitamin E complex. The same is true for vitamin D. Vitamin D... Uh, in evolution is only one of the molecules in the vitamin D complex. And when I say vitamin D complex, I mean the things that occur biochemically in our body in response to sunlight exposure. What are some of those things? Uh, number one, <clears throat> ultraviolet light goes through the retina of the eye, stimulates the pineal gland, which then stimulates the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which is considered the master gland, which then stimulates the thyroid and the adrenals and the ovaries. So you have this entire hormonal orchestra that occurs in response to sunlight. In addition, and this really uh, surprised me when I learned about this, uh, vitamin D, in addition to producing vitamin D in the skin, ultraviolet light uh, causes the skin to produce a molecule known as corticotropin-releasing hormone. We all learned in uh, physiology that corticotropin-releasing hormone is a hormone that's produced in the brain, in the hypothalamus. It has effects on the immune system. It has effects on the cardiovascular system. It has effect on the gastrointestinal tract. And this molecule is not just produced in the brain. It's produced in the skin in response to uh, sunlight exposure. Another factor is that vitamin D is not only produced, but so are vitamin D breakdown products. When you irradiate the skin with sunlight, you break down some of the vitamin D that you have just produced. And that produces another molecule which functions, functions as a moderator to the effect of vitamin D. So if you're taking tons of vitamin D by mouth, you're not going to get that same modulator that you get if you're soaking yourself in sunlight. My point so is- Sunlight really helps produce and promote and modulate the symphony of the hormonal cascade and the immune modulation. We are meant to be living on planet Earth and, and interacting with the sun, and we do it less and less in modern cultural life. We, we put do. sunscreen on even when we're outside in the sun. Well, dermatologists have made us be very afraid of, of the sun. I remember some dermatologists uh, came up to me at a conference and says, you got these little spots on your face and uh, you're going to be a mess in 20 years. <laughs> uh, uh, stay out of the sun. At and the I was last thinking, conference, you know, you're not that good looking yourself, but that, I didn't say it. <laughs> at um, the last conference I was at, Alan, I met this dermatologist who lost his license because he was talking against 
sunscreen and he had a podcast. He was writing a blog against it. He was championing us not to use sunscreen near as much as we were. And the local dermatologists in his town were active in having him lose his license for that. That's crazy. crazy. Well, certainly excessive sun exposure causes skin cancer. We know that. And I'm not promoting excessive sun exposure. You don't need a lot to get your vitamin D and your other compounds. How much do you need? How much do you need? Well, maybe 10 to 15 minutes a day, uh, two to three days a week during the sunny seasons. And if you do it around noontime when the the radiation is much stronger, you can get get by with about half that amount. So you don't need a whole lot. And what I do personally and what I have my kids do is you expose yourself to 10 or 15 minutes of sunlight and then you put on the sunscreens. Now, I agree that uh, there are some problems with sunscreens. They contain a lot of potentially toxic chemicals, uh, but I'm not going to really get into that at this point because we're talking about vitamin D and sunlight and all that. Well, um, this has been really phenomenal. And we're really concerned that people are using vitamin D as though it was an M&M and they can take large amounts without any discernment. And not only that, you've shared with us that there's this whole family of complex of vitamin D, just like there is with vitamin E. And when you're taking an over-the-counter supplement, you're not getting that whole family. Just a question. If when people are taking fish oil, would they be getting the whole complex when they're taking a cod liver oil? No, no, they're just getting the vitamin D. So Um, you need to understand that supplementation does not mimic the sun. And not in any way. You don't get the pineal gland stimulation. You don't get the corticotropin releasing hormone. And you don't get the degradation product of vitamin D that moderates the effect of vitamin D. You so, don't you get know, the John fun Denver. of hanging out in a bikini on the beach. You know what? Yeah, there you, you know, go. There you go. John Denver. Didn't he write a song called A Bottle of Vitamin D on My Shoulder Makes Me Happy? <laughs> or was, was it Sunshine on My Shoulder Makes Me Happy? I think he had Sunshine it right, John on Denver. My shoulder. Did. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, one of the other things that we wanted to cover in this show, so thank you so much for your erudite and massive understanding of the bigger picture of the literature because so many people are taking too much vitamin D. So now we know the nuances, and this is science-based nuances. You also wanted to share with us the nuances of nutritional research, all the fraudulent research that's out there. You, one of your major missions in life is to let people know about nutrition as a tool and to let them know what's out there that's not healthy and it might even be fraudulent. So can you chat on that? Well, I've spent the last 46 years uh, partly practicing medicine uh, and partly reading the research, finding it, going all the way back to 1900 to look at old studies, keeping up with modern research. And I've looked at over 50,000 studies. So So I have an idea Uh, In addition to being a strong believer that we can use nutritional supplements and diets to prevent and treat many illnesses, um, I also in recent years have become concerned that a lot of research that's being published uh, is based on uh, fabricated evidence, meaning they made it up. They didn't do the research. They wrote a paper on research that hasn't actually been done. Uh, And, you know, this is, is a concern. It's hard to prove. But uh, there are certain warning signs that raise my eyebrows because when you, when you've spent your whole life reading studies, your uh, your meter goes up when something looks unkosher or potentially fraudulent. And the worst offenders are from Iran. Now it's gotten to the point where I can read a title, just the title of the paper, and I can already surmise, usually correctly that the researchers are from Iran and they showed a very strong beneficial effect from whatever they were doing. And if you look at the study, you can find all these eyebrow raising things that make you think they made the whole thing up. Because the titles sound too good to be true. Is that what you're saying? It sounds, first of all, a lot of times it is a randomized double blind trial which are very expensive. These studies are very expensive to do. So they're doing a randomized double blind trial to investigate a treatment for a particular condition when in my knowledge of this literature, there is no prior evidence that this has worked. Now, researchers do not spend enormous amounts of money to do a complicated double blind trial until they've had at least case reports suggesting it's beneficial or else 
uncontrolled trials where they gave it to some people and they got better. Then maybe they'll go on to a double blind trial. But they pull these things out of the blue. It's like, what is the biochemical basis for thinking that would have worked? I can't think of any. So what's and the yet- danger and what's coming out? And why are you wanting to talk about this? Where is this influencing medicine? And why is this you know, really on your radar? Well, part of it is it just really gets my goat that people are publishing this stuff and they're, they're poisoning the integrity of science. That uh, by itself is enough to annoy me and to not, enough to have made me spend a lot of tri- time writing letters to, to journals, explaining why this study is a problem and collaborating with us, others to try to blow the whistle on some of this stuff. More, uh, more dangerous sometimes is if they, uh, if they report a finding that actually has clinical importance. For example, women that have precancerous changes of the cervix, abnormal pap smears, are supposed to go back for a regular follow-up. And, uh, you know, there's a standard approach on how to deal with this. There are two studies that came out, which I think both of them were fabricated. Uh, One of them says taking selenium supplements can reverse an abnormal pap smear. The other one said that taking folic acid can do that. Now, if somebody reads that and believes it, maybe they'll figure, well... Didn't Maria Bell a long time ago do a randomized trial on folic acid and vitamin C with abnormal uh, pap smears? Well, I think think that was indole-3-carbinol, which is an extract of 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 broccoli and Brussels sprouts. I don't recall one that she did with uh, with that. Um, I don't know whether vitamin C really works. Um, I mean, I certainly would take it, but I, I wouldn't persuade me to wait six right. months for my follow-up rather than three months. There are some situations where it's actually clinically important uh, that people not believe this stuff. Uh, right. But most of it is the idea that, you know, you say something works and then people are going to be spending their money on a supplement that they don't really need. Um, so uh, let, me, let me give you a couple examples. Aside from doing studies where expensive studies where there's no prior evidence of effectiveness and no biochemical reason to think it would be effective. Another thing that raises my eyebrow is when, uh, I actually have two eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> now I just knocked something out of my ear. One here, of the least. cool things about knowing you all these years is no matter what, we'll always look the same to each other. Hopefully. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think you look just like when I, he first fixed you up with me. Okay. So there's one researcher from Iran. And by the way, Iran is by far the worst offender, but I've also seen some very questionable research coming out of Egypt and India and Japan sometimes, definitely China and sometimes Pakistan. But Iran, I'll I'll focus on here. Um, There's one researcher uh, who has published in the past five years more than 170 randomized controlled double-blind trials. Now, as I said, I have followed the medical literature and working on nutritional medicine, my textbook, uh, I have uh, I have looked at researchers and how much they can publish in what period of time. The most prolific researchers I have ever seen, if they're lucky, they'll publish four or five double-blind trials over a 10-year period, four or five. This guy has published 170 randomized controlled trials in five years, and this is in a, a low-income country. Iran does not have a lot of money. I don't know where all this money is coming from. In addition, there are some uh, highly irregular things that this researcher has done. For example, he has about 25 double-blind studies in women with gestational diabetes. That's where you get diabetes around the mid-time of pregnancy, and it causes problems later on. In one of the early studies, he reported that when you take magnesium, if these women with gestational diabetes take magnesium, it greatly reduces uh, adverse outcomes in the babies. They have a lot less hospitalization and they have a lot less jaundice. Now, one would think that if somebody finds this uh, profound effect, that in the future, all patients treated by this researcher would be told to take magnesium. And they would compare magnesium plus placebo to magnesium plus some other treatment. That would be the the ethical thing to do. But in the subsequent 20 or so studies that this person did, the patients were were not allowed to take anything other than the study medication, meaning they were not allowed to take something that this doctor had reported previously was beneficial. So ethical violations. A third factor that raises my eyebrows is the statistical handling 
of the research. And you got to look at it closely to see this. But uh, for those of your listeners who know math, uh, when you do, uh, when you report numbers, you report the mean, which is the average, and then you report something called the standard deviation, which is a mathematical number. And these numbers would be random. However, in, in about 60 of this researcher's papers, he listed all these different standard deviations and they were identical. So in one study, he listed 34 different outcomes. And in each of those outcomes, the standard deviation in the placebo group was identical to the standard deviation in the other group. And that is impossible. That is as likely as uh, all of the atoms in the universe over one. So is he just doing this to become famous or is he somehow making money from it? Or what is? what do you think is going on? I don't know what he's doing. What I, what I know is that researchers who have a lot of publications are held in very high esteem in the research community. It might also help them get grant money, which will help their income. Uh, but there's just one crazy thing after another that I'm seeing. A lot of times they don't list a funding source. They don't say who funded the study. It's like, all right, well, how did you do the study then? Typically they, they list this. So um, what I'm doing now is if I see a study coming out of Iran, I'm either likely to ignore it completely because three out of four times, if I look at it carefully, I find evidence that it was made up. And we're, we're talking about many dozens of papers now that come out. And uh, in other cases, uh, I might read it and uh, then cast it aside after I si decide it's a problem. So um, I'm just saying this to alert the research community uh, that certain countries are publishing stuff that you cannot necessarily believe. What about in the U.S.? And, you know, I, I brought up an article to you a, a number of years ago and you went, oh, that's new, the journal Nutrients. That's not a peer reviewed journal. You could pay one thousand several hundred dollars and just get an article published in there. You can literally get your own article. Like when I got my article published um, with Nathan Bryan in the University of Texas Medical School. It took us three to four years. We had to keep, when it went through peer review, we had to keep changing things that they questioned us. It was a big deal to get it published. Not in nutrients. You can just pay for it to get it in. And now when I lecture at A4M or PCCA, more and more studies, when they note them at the bottom of the slide, a lot of them are coming from the journal Nutrients. Even the article that was on gluten, where they took a number of slices of gastrointestinal tissue in a petri dish and exposed it to gluten, a very famous study that was published in Nutrients. So what do you what do you think about that? Well, Nutrients has only been out for about four or five years, and uh, they're now publishing about 400 articles a month. And I actually look through those titles because some of them are very interesting. Uh, Nutrients is only one of uh, hundreds of what they call open access journals, where you uh, pay to have your, your article published. Now, that does not automatically mean that it's fraudulent. And in fact, uh, there's some rather interesting studies I've seen from that journal. And when I read them... It just means um, they didn't go through peer review, though. Well, they go through a kind of peer review where there's a conflict of interest because uh, they... Uh, make money when the articles are published. The journals make money by accepting, and they don't make any money by rejecting the articles. There was a study done uh, several years ago where they submitted obviously ridiculous papers to uh, open access journals, and, and, a, and an uncomfortably high percentage of the submissions, they did not spot these obviously ridiculous things. <clears throat> so the point being that, that peer review does exist, but it is not nearly as good as the peer review in uh, the other kinds of journals. But even the, uh, the well-recognized journals, like the one you mentioned, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, British Journal of Nutrition, some other highly respected journals have published what are, in my opinion, fraudulent papers. And you write letters to the editors of these journals, and a lot of times they do not feel like dealing with it. It's a lot of work to go after these people. Right, and, uh, right. It, it's a problem. Well, a lot of us in the hormone community are very upset because just recently, September 2nd, Lancet published a paper making a lot more women and even practitioners, I've been getting emails from them, worried about hormone replacement and linking it to breast cancer, that when you take a look at the studies that are cited in that paper, it's not really supporting it. And I've been trying to get some really um, prestigious people that are the perfect people on the show. I don't, I don't have them 
hooked in yet, but it, but this happens a lot. So what do you think you're talking about all these fraudulent papers in other countries? What are your thoughts about a lot of the research that's coming out of the U.S.? Well, most of the research in the U.S., I think, is legitimate. At least they did the research that they said they did. They analyzed it properly. Uh, what I sometimes disagree with, and this is based on a worldview and based on a philosophy, sometimes I disagree with the conclusions. Uh, for example, I read the same data that they presented, and I come up with the conclusion maybe this treatment was effective, whereas they might come up with the conclusion that it was not effective, and that is uh, depending on how you, you uh, examine the research. For example, uh, one study showed that there is a 22% reduction in the number of days ill in people who take vitamin C, randomized controlled trial, people who take vitamin C compared with those who took a placebo. The problem was this 22% reduction was not statistically significant. So the researchers concluded that it didn't work. I concluded that the correct interpretation is that there was a 22% reduction in days ill, but that since it was not statistically significant, we are less than 95% certain that the effect was real. That is very different from saying that it didn't work. So the correct mathematical conclusion, in my opinion, was the one that I just put forward. So there are many situations where you can look at the same data and come up with a different interpretation. Totally. I remember that I once brought you an article. Um, the gentleman had, I can't remember his name right now or where it was from, but he had done research that consuming so many prunes a day would help increase bone density. And you went through that article and showed me where you felt in the belly of the statistics, the way that he analyzed them wasn't accurate. So I wrote the author of the article and I presented him and he just gave me some very interesting <laughs> He didn't want to hear my evaluation of your evaluation of his evaluation. But anyway, so. Well, nobody likes to be accused of having dyspronia. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of your listeners can look that one up. I apologize for that. I love that. That's great. <laughs> you know, a lot of times when you used to, you were famous for the Wright Gaby seminars, which. Um, That's right, spelled W R I G H T, along with Jonathan Wright. And yeah. Fritz Perlberg was your business manager and seminar conductor, the gentleman that I dated for a while that we all hung out with. And, um, you know, you used to open up those conferences with your guitar, singing your songs. I should have asked you to bring your guitar and sing some of your songs. I didn't request that. Darn it. I'm just thinking we'll of that it. now. We'll do it next time. Next, we'll time. next time. We'll have to do it next time. Yeah. But what I love is that you have such a great wit besides such detail. I don't think we ever could have made it being married because you're so precise, so literally precise that it's only your lovely wife, Beth, that can, you know, live with that precision. I'd probably have wilted by now. Now, but I love that, that you apply that to the science. And we're grateful to you that you've made this lifelong work. And you're there for us championing the truth in nutrition. It's just well, incredible. Thank you. And that's, that's what I tried to do in my textbook. It is a life's work. And uh, <clears throat> if I could mention that right now, it's called Nutritional Medicine. Uh, I do my best to um, separate the garbage from what is real. And I analyze things and I try to explain why. I think uh, what I think, and I cite everything that I say, so you can look it up yourself and evaluate it yourself if you are an academic person. And uh, it's available on my website. The website is called drgaby.com. That's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-G-A-B-Y.com. And the book is called Nutritional Medicine. Uh, you can also Google Nutritional Medicine, uh, and it, it the website comes up uh, near the top. In the show notes, uh, drlindsayberkson.com, we'll have uh, under the show, because we have all the podcasts there on my website, we'll have the show notes and we'll have all these links where you can get this. If you are a coach, if you are a doctor, if you're a naturopath, if you are a functional medicine person, if you are somebody who has just a vast interest in nutrition and you get all these different nutritional links in your emails every day, this is a book that you must must have. I'm not just saying I don't get any money from Alan. I love him to death and respect him to death. But this is the most must have nutrition book that's ever been written. It's true that it's been his lifelong work. And when you hear often that people don't believe in hormones, they don't believe in nutrition, they don't think there's enough 
research in nutrition, this is the book that gives you the studies that shows what works, what doesn't work, and what research is out there. And he's updated it. This is the second edition. Second edition. Yeah. And the coolest thing is, even though it's my life's work, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really fun. The book is written for, uh, for practitioners. It's written for practitioners, but uh, I've seen many non-practitioners who've looked at it and I say, <laughs> you know, do you understand all this? And they say, yeah, I can follow about 95% of it. I have to look up some words here and there, but, but I can generally follow it. 95%. That's really incredible. I'm working on my nutritional gastroenterology book, and I've gotten much lower percentage of what people say they can understand. I remember that you and I both made an agreement that if we both weren't married by the time we hit 40, that we would we would end up getting married. And I got a we phone were. call from you when you turned 40, and I picked up the phone, and all I heard from you was, we don't really have to do this, do we? <laughs> Well, I didn't get married to my soulmate till 49, but maybe when maybe when the odometer turns and we pass 100 and get up to 140, then maybe we'll get married. No, you're with the perfect woman. I love Beth. She's a naturopathic doctor and she delivers babies and she's delivered a bunch of your babies and you have incredible children. And it's just been Thank one you. of the gifts in my life to have you as a lifelong friend. It really well, has Well, the feeling been. is mutual. It's, I love you, Alan. I really do. You and too. I I respect your work so much. This is so important about vitamin D. Most people don't, most physicians, practitioners don't realize this. It's very important information you shared. And also that there's so much fraudulent research out there. We all must be on our toes on either perspective for what's right to make sure it stays right and for what's wrong to make sure that it gets moved out and doesn't have influence over clinical action. So your work is so huge. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Thanks for coming on the show today. Is there any final words or jokes or anything that you might want to share? Oh, you put me on the spot. I'll have to pass. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks so much. And don't forget, Nutritional Medicine, second edition. We're going to have all the information in the show notes, but www. Dr spelled out d-o-c-t-o-r drgaby.com and if you love information and in shows like this please go to itunes and leave a review and we have exact steps on how to do it because it seems so difficult you have to belong to mensa to be able to do it so we have exact steps at the end of every single show notes so you can go and let more and more people many people need to hear the show they need to hear this about vitamin d so thanks again and um i look forward to seeing you in person and give my love to beth okay Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye.